begin when you are ready. Okay, I'm ready. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Again, the flattering introduction, Dr. Loeb and uh, Ms. Rainwater, thank you for arranging, helping me with the technology to get started here. Um, this is a really important time, actually, to talk about insulin treatment because it's a hundred year anniversary of the discovery of insulin. Insulin was discovered in 1921, um, principally by a uh, surgical resident, Dr. Frederick Banting, and a medical student, Dr. Charles, who became Dr. Charles Best at the University of Toronto. I just wanted to share a little bit of the historical information about the discovery of insulin. Dr. Uh, Banting had finished a two-year surgical residency and had applied for a surgical faculty position at the University of Toronto. He was denied a surgical faculty position, but he was informed that there were be a spot in a research laboratory, he could come up with a research idea. And he went to the library at the University of Toronto and he read as much as he could about what was known about diabetes at the time and he came back with a research idea that, that pancreatic extracts might lower glucose levels in diabetic dogs. And that was his research project. In 1921, he successfully showed that exactly that, that that extracts purified um, were successful at lowering blood glucose levels in, in dogs that had been depancreatized for the development of diabetes. In 1922, he also showed that a purified pancreatic extract was successful at uh, treating diabetic ketoacidosis. And the very first human who was treated with insulin, his name was Leonard Thompson, he was a 14 year old boy, who was admitted in diabetic coma and ketoacidosis to Toronto General Hospital. Um, in 1923, Eli Lilly and then Novo Nordisk companies, uh, Eli Lilly in the United States and Novo Nordisk in, in Denmark were successful at commercializing the development, production, and, and sale of insulin. And so in 1923, insulin became widely available to diabetic patients, uh, both in Europe and the United States. Before that time, if you develop type 1 diabetes, um, you were placed on a keto diet, which has become popular lately for some reason. But a keto diet was a diet very low in carbohydrate to try to control hyperglycemia so that patients would be less likely to go and do a hyperglycemic coma from their deficiency of insulin and type 1 diabetes. When the discovery of insulin uh, was pronounced in the Toronto newspapers, Persons with type 1 diabetes, particularly parents of children with type 1 diabetes, brought their kids from all over the world to Toronto to be some of the first patients who would be treated with insulin. Um, and insulin is very successful at controlling hyperglycemia and preventing ketoacidosis in these patients. Next slide. Now, this is what the very first insulin syringe and needle looked like. And the very first insulin was essentially what we call regular insulin today. It was an insulin that worked for about four hours in lowering the blood glucose levels. So patients or family members had to inject this insulin every four hours to control hyperglycemia and prevent ketoacidosis. Somewhat crude looking needles, which were very painful and left off, um, and often left many scars. Next slide. Now in the last century then, uh, there's been a tremendous amount of change and innovation in the development of insulin treatment. I think the most important, the three most important innovations that occurred were of course the purification of insulin by Banting's laboratory in Toronto and then subsequently by the commercial insulin companies. Um, also the development of a protracted, an insulin with a protracted duration of action and the first such insulin was NPH, neutroprotamine hagedorn insulin. Um, and this insulin had a time duration of action of about 12 to 14 hours so that patients wouldn't have to get up in the middle of the night to inject insulin so it helped them preserve their sleep in their general sense of well-being. Um, subsequent innovations were the development of human insulins. And human insulins came along because there were many allergic reactions 
um, to the animal insulins, usually beef and pork, which were used before human insulin. In the, I can remember during my residency at Tulane in the late 70s, a 14-year-old patient who was admitted with diabetic ketoacidosis and coma, and who did not respond to IV beef or pork insulin to, con to correct her ketoacidosis. The usual insulin uh, treatment dosage for DKA is 0.1 unit per kilogram per body weight. She weighed about 50 kilograms. So five units an hour, 1.1 unit per kilogram per hour, should have corrected her ketoacidosis, but 50 units an hour didn't correct her ketoacidosis, nor did 200 units an hour. And I had to call John Davidson, who was the insulin guru at Eli Lilly at that time, and he said, she probably has blocking antibodies to animal insulins. At the time, there was no human insulin available, so he said, I will send you an insulin, the most dissimilar insulin to animal insulin. And I said, what is that? And he said, salmon insulin. So beef insulins had about three or four amino acid differences from human insulin, but salmon insulin had about 50 amino acid uh, difference from both beef and human insulin. So he sent me a vial of salmon insulin and she responded dramatically to it. And we were able to correct her ketoacidosis and revolve her diabetic coma. And we sent her home on salmon insulin, which she stayed on until she was desensitized to pork insulin. And then she continued her diabetes treatment with pork insulin. I'll mention another case of a 15 year old boy in Honolulu when I was at the University of Hawaii who was admitted for a severe anaphylactic reaction animal insulin. We did not have human insulin, and this was in the 80s. And he had to be completely withdrawn from insulin, which resulted in diabetic ketoacidosis and coma, and then resensitized to purified pork insulin. So he spent about two days in the ICU in diabetic coma till he could be desensitized to um, purify pork insulin, enough so that his ketoacidosis could be treated and he could be sent home on sub-Q purified pork insulin. Um, so those are some dramatic examples of some of the problems that we encountered with animal insulins. And so the first human insulins came along in about 1990, I think um, human regular insulin was the initial human insulin, then human NPH. But since then we have um, human insulins uh, produced by DNA technology of all different time duration of actions. We have short acting, actually our, our current, current landscape of insulin would include rapid, rapid acting insulin, such as FIAS, rapid insulins like Lyspro, Aspart and Glulysine, the rapid, rapid insulin and the rapid insulins are used primarily to control prandial excursions of glucose. Short acting insulin, which is still regular insulin, um, which has a slower onset of action, as you can see, compared to a rapid acting insulin. So it's less effective at preventing postprandial excursions of glucose in most patients, unless they, they have gastroparesis. Um, and then we have the intermediate NPH, which is now human NPH, which again works for 12 to 14 hours. This is a very effective insulin at controlling hyperglycemia in patients who are in prednisone uh, treatment in the morning for inflammatory illnesses. We have um, long duration of action of datamir, and it shows datamir here at 16 to 18 hours. Usually datamir doesn't work for 24 hours, um, more likely 16 to 20 hours in in our population of patients. So it shouldn't be used as the sole um, long acting or basal insulin in the person with type one diabetes, but it can be used as a bedtime insulin in type two diabetes, patients who are on other treatments to control postprandial hyperglycemia. And then we have the longer duration of acting insulin. So first one was Lantus. And since Lantus, Lantus has a duration of action of 24 hours, as long as the dose is usually greater than um, 0.25 units per kilogram body weight. In children who don't need as much insulin, doses are much lower than that. And, often, and, and typically children on basal insulin take them twice a day. 
is in the very low doses of basal insulin that they don't usually work for 24 hours. Then the longest duration of insulin action we have now is Toshiba, which actually can work up to about 40 to 44 hours in our patients. It's administered though as a single daily dose of insulin. Um, it's an excellent insulin for use in patients who are particularly type one patients who are prone to nocturnal hypoglycemia because there's a lower risk of hypoglycemia. But this particular insulin compared to Lantus or Levomir has basal insulins. And uh, it's also so an excellent insulin to consider using in teenagers who skip insulin doses. They're a lot less likely to develop diabetic ketoacidosis on a much longer uh, basal insulin, a uh, much longer duration of action basal insulin. Next slide. And this actually is the time duration of action of, of, of um, Idegludec, which is Trashiba insulin. Um, you hear that basal insulins don't have a peak, but they all have a peak. And so they all can produce hypoglycemia, particularly related to their peak effect. Um, Degludec has the lowest peak, but almost all of these basal insulins have greater glucose lowering effect for instance, Lantus in the first 12 hours of administer after administration than in the second 12 hours because the peak is, early, is around usually between 8 and 12 hours. Um, in Declodec, the peak is flatter, which is probably why there's less hypoglycemia, why there's a longer duration of action of the insulin. NPH has a peak about 6 to 8 hours after it's injected, and it's a much stronger peak than, than either Lantus or Levomir. And so when NPH is given in the morning, it peaks at lunchtime and partially controls hyperglycemia at dinner time. But when it's given before dinner, it peaks around one or two o'clock in the morning when most persons have the nadir, the lowest point of their blood glucose level over 24 hours. And so it's, it's inappropriately timed and given before dinner, which is one of the issues with 70-30 insulin, which is a mixture of NPH and regular rapid acting insulin. Uh, NPH should typically be given at bedtime when it's used for the treatment of, of diabetes. So why would anyone use the old-time NPH? Because it costs $25 a vial at Walmart. If you had to pay out of your pocket for insulin, um, you can buy regular insulin at $25 a vial. You can buy NPH at $25 a vial. Lily Humalog is about $100 a vial. Levomir is $350 a vial, and Lantus is about $450 a vial. Trashiva is now about $560 a vial. So there's a tremendous difference in the cost of these insulins, particularly for patient populations that don't have very good insurance coverage. Now, the Medicaid formula is actually pretty darn good. It's expanded access to many different insulins, including um, newer analog insulins, the fast-acting insulins, and Levomir or, or, or Lantus. But we have patients who, uh, who have no insurance coverage that we see sometimes at University Medical Center. And we often treat them with uh, NPH and regular each $25 a vial. And I can, I can speak from experience because for the first 20 years of my career as an endocrinologist, those were the only two insulins we had. And we were able to get a lot of patients under really good control. Um, but the newer insulins are more physiologic. They, they simulate the normal um, basal secretion of insulin and mealtime peak of, peaks of insulin much better than NPH and regular. And that's why we use them if, we, if they're available. They just more closely simulate insulin physiology. Next slide. And so I wanted to say that insulin treatment, of course, is the most important treatment of type 1 diabetes. It's the, right now the only treatment of type 1 diabetes, although SGLT2 inhibitors may come along in the not too distant future. Um, in, in the long run, it's the most important treatment of type 2 diabetes, not initially, but, but for most of the duration of, of, uh, of insulin and the, of, of diabetes in these particular persons. And the reason is shown in this particular slide, persons with type 2 diabetes develop insulin resistance, which drives increased production of insulin above and beyond normal levels. But 
but um, if insulin resistance is not reversed, which of course can happen with bariatric surgery in the very obese patients, if it's not reversed, then insulin production begins to wane because the beta cells become exhausted, essentially, and dysfunctional. And then the other thing that happens over time, on exposure to hyperglycemia or elevated levels of free fatty acids, probably both, is that there's beta cell toxicity and beta cells actually die off persons with type 2 diabetes. And it's been guesstimated that most persons when diagnosed with type 2 diabetes have about 50% of their maximum insulin production capacity left. So they've already lost 50% of their ability to produce large amounts of insulin. And then over another 10 years, they're down to about 20% of their insulin production capacity despite all of our other treatments for type 2 diabetes. And so 90% of patients will not produce enough insulin to be able to be, after 10 years of diabetes, to be able to be managed by medications without the addition of insulin. So almost all of our type 2 diabetic patients will end up eventually on insulin treatment unless we develop some means of stopping the uh, toxicity in the beta cells and preserving beta cell function over a longer period of time. Um, GLP-1 medications do that a little bit, but, but most patients who are on GLP-1 medications eventually end up on insulin as a, patients on other uh, forms of type 2 oral medications for type 2 diabetes. Next slide. And this is uh, the American Diabetes Association um, treatment guideline for type 2 diabetes. And they start out with everything else but insulin um, for patients who have access to all of these other medications, which are extremely expensive. Unless a person actually has an A1C of greater than 10%, then it is recommended to start with insulin treatment. Before I came to Louisiana, I practiced in the state of New Mexico, and I supervised the treatment of a lot of Native American young men and women, usually in their teen years, who were admitted to our hospitals there with diabetic ketoacidosis. Now, almost all of those patients had type 2 diabetes. They probably slowly developed type 2 diabetes, hadn't been diagnosed in a timely fashion, developed severe hyperglycemia, which, which was enough to turn off beta cell production of insulin. Then they in turn presented to the hospital with diabetic ketoacidosis and needed to be started on insulin treatment. But typically after about a month of insulin, if you measured their C-PEPA levels, which had been less than one on admission, uh, were, had increased to two or three or four or, or even higher indicating that they were not producing insulin much better and they could be weaned off insulin and treated with oral agents. So we do use insulin treatment again for all, initially for all type one diabetics, but also for type two persons with type two diabetes who present with diabetic emergencies or severe hyperglycemia with A1C levels of greater than 10%. But most of these patients can eventually be weaned to other medications for the treatment of type two diabetes. I just wanted to bring that up. Next slide. And this is my last slide. Um, and, and so most of our patients with type 2 diabetes who end up on insulin therapy have been tried on usually metformin initially, um, sometimes sulfonylurea agents. Uh, I think more commonly now, they're, they're more likely to be tried on a GLP-1 uh, added on to metformin than a sulfonylurea agent. There's some evidence that sulfonylurea agents may hasten of the march to insulin treatment in type 2 diabetes compared to GLP-1s. Um, we're now able to use SGLT2 inhibitors. Both GLP-1s and SGLT2 inhibitors result in weight loss as well, which is an important uh, treatment goal also for most of our type 2 diabetic patients. But again, over time, uh, many, many, many years um, for our type 2 diabetic population, will often end up on insulin, particularly when their A1Cs can't be controlled with two or three oral medications or two oral medications and, and including an injectable GLP-1. Um, and so when we start 
start insulin, we usually start with long acting a basal insulin at bedtime, add it onto their oral medications. Um, and then many of these patients over time will need rapid acting insulin at meals. Um, so that, so I, I still believe that insulin is the most important treatment in type two diabetes over time. It is the treatment for type one diabetes. I wanted to finish there um, and then take any questions if you have any. Thank you, Dr. Galligan. Um, I enjoyed that lecture. I like the visual side of insulin action and there's so many um, on the market now. So I think it's, it's hard to kind of keep track of everything and, and you know, think of those peak of action and so on. Um, I have a quick question and then I'll open it up to everybody else, uh, but we appreciate you coming. Um, my question is, uh, I guess if you're, if I'm thinking of a patient and I want to start insulin and you know, most patients are hesitant about insulin. Nobody's sitting there saying, oh, I can't wait. What do I do? You know? So one, how do you decide? And let's pretend this patient is very resistant of doing much of insulin, anything. Now, and most of them would be, right? A lot of patients are, even if they're gonna start it, they wanna do minimal and how do we do this? So if you could give us some strategies of how do you get them to say yes to insulin? And then what is your usual um, starting point? Let's pretend they don't have the best insurance. So kind of real life situations where we don't have as much finances, the patient is not really that interested. If you could give us a few tips. Is that question directed to me or to the audience? Yes. To you, please. Oh, okay. <laughs> so um, in the type one population, of course, insulin is started upon diagnosis. Um, and, and we start with uh, insulins that closely mimic insulin secretory physiology as possible. Um, unless patients have restricted financial uh, access to um, the newer analog insulins. So we typically would start with a long acting insulin, either Lantus or probably usually more often than not Lantus insulin as their basal insulin, because it has a 24 hour duration of action in most doses that are used to, um, to treat um, uh, adults with uh, type one diabetes. And typically, um, so let's say a 70, let's say it's a 100 kilogram person with, who's been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. We would start with about um, 0.2 to 0.25 units per kilogram, um, about 25 units a day of basal insulin. And about 50% of their insulin requirements going to be basal insulin, and the other 50% is usually mealtime insulin. So if we think, so if we start with 20 units at bedtime, then we would probably start with five or six units before meals. Okay, so almost a similar quantity of insulin for mealtime coverage. Um, that's in the type one population. Um, in type two diabetes, these patients are usually on other medications, usually two or three other medications. And typically their A1C has persisted at above 8%. Um, despite using three other medications, including a GLP-1 at this time. And so we would start, um, again, probably with about 20 units of bedtime insulin, usually just a basal insulin. And I would continue them on their other medications. I would hope that at least for some duration of time, a basal insulin uh, added to their other medications would, would uh, achieve the target A1C level assuming that the basal insulin corrects our fasting glucose level to a relatively a reasonable range, usually somewhere in the range of about 90 to 120 milligrams per cent. And so we would start, you could start at 20 units, or again, you could do the 0.2 to 0.25 units per kilogram for basal insulin starting dose at bedtime. In clinical trials, when this has been done, most adults with type two diabetes who are started on insulin on top of their other medications, the average basal insulin requirement is usually somewhere in the range of about 40 to 50 units. So the, the basal insulin has to be increased over time to achieve that target blood glucose 
but it's better to start low to begin with so that you don't cause nocturnal hypoglycemia. Um, and then as long as their target A1C is in the, for an adult uh, with type 2 diabetes is in the uh, expected range, uh, they can stay on basal, in, they can stay on a basal insulin at night with their uh, other medications. When their A1C levels begin to increase above 8%, again, then I would typically add a rapid acting insulin at their, their dominant meal. Um, in time, they might need rapid acting insulin at all of their meals. Um, when they're on a combination of insulin and rapid act, of, of basal and rapid acting insulins, I typically discontinue on the urea drugs, but I would keep them on metformin and a GLP-1 because those medications can work um, in collaboration with insulin to maintaining better diabetes control. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that kind of initial summary of kind of what to think when you're just initiating insulin. And I really appreciate the history. It's, it's good timing for this lecture. Um, I will open up the floor to anybody else with any questions for Dr. Galligan. Yes, uh, Dr. Galligan, um, thank you for sharing that uh, work you did in New Mexico. My uh, question is, is um, are there we just lost you. For I think it's a bad connection. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? I can hear you right now. Okay. Pass me. Okay. Good. Um, when it comes to African Americans, Native Americans, and Hispanics, with the prevalence of type two type two diabetes. Is it primarily lifestyle or genetics? And are there any protective factors that could prevent that in those populations? Well, I, I think it's a combination of both genetics and lifestyle. Um, so I don't, there was a, clinical trial called the Diabetes Prevention Trial, where they compared lifestyle modifications, which included diet and exercise, enough to lose about 7% of your body weight, to um, the medication treatments for the prevention to progression to type 2 diabetes in persons with prediabetes. One of the medications was metformin, another one was Resilin. The Resilin arm of that trial was discontinued because after um, some patients not necessarily in that trial, but other patients reported severe liver issues on Resilin. Okay. But the lifestyle arm was more successful at preventing the progression to type two diabetes over a period of five years and metformin by its, and then metformin alone, okay? So, now this was a very intensive lifestyle modification. All of these patients had physical tr exercise trainers, okay? And met with diet on a weekly basis for several months. Um, the trial lasted five years though, and, and there was overall um, about a 60% reduction in risk of progression of diabetes with lifestyle modification. Whereas with metformin, there was only about a 30% reduction in risk, I mean, which is still significant, but not nearly as great as lifestyle modification. Okay, thank I you. I can also say this based on working with Native Americans with diabetes. There are, there's a Pima Indian tribe in Arizona. They have the highest prevalence of diabetes of any ethnic group in the world. 85% of the adults over the age of 40 develop type two diabetes. Um, their cousins of Pima Indians in Mexico who live across the border, who herd sheep and goats still. Uh, so, um, that's their 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 economy is based on on their their, their herds of goats and sheep, um, and they typically walk anywhere from five to ten miles a day. Okay. Um, the prevalence of diabetes in that group as adults over the age of forty is about three percent. So this is a genetically predestined group for diabetes, but if they have an unusual physical activity, um, they're not eating. Western diet, so to speak, 
modern Western diet, um, they have a very low risk of diabetes, a much lower risk than Caucasians in the United States even. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? So we're nearing the end of the day. Um, if anybody has time for one more question. Okay. Well, thank you again, Dr. Galligan. Um, elegant, beautiful presentation. And thank you for kind of gently telling us that if we walk and do good things like that and exercise and eat well, we could beat our genetics. I like that. That's positive. But today's um, take home message is to herd goats. <laughs> yes. Be active, whatever that means. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone. And um, we will be seeing you in two weeks.